Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rod Quinn. I'm the facilitator for this session. I would like to, I'll individually welcome our guests and tell you a little bit about them, just as they give you a brief introduction. But I will say that um, this discussion about your future on a plate is about your future, what you will be eating, not tonight, maybe, but 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. And I'd like to, I'd like to sort of impress upon you that uh, this is going to be indicative in a way. It's not going to be exhaustive, so we're not going to solve every possible problem, but we do want to touch on as many as possible. I also want to really reinforce the fact that this is an informal discussion. This is hopefully a lively discussion. This is not going to be one of those dull ones you've been to. We're hoping this is going to be a really, really interesting one. Before we start, I would like to First, with a show of hands, does anybody know what they're having for dinner tonight? There you go. Generally, about 80% of the population don't know at three in the afternoon what they're having for dinner that night. So how can we possibly know what we're going to be eating in 30, 40 years' time? Hopefully, in an hour and a half, we will get a better idea. So, without any further ado, we will. Would you please welcome our uh, panellists? We begin with uh, the Honourable Sid Sidebottom. He is the Parliamentary Secretary for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. He has chosen to be here today, which we really appreciate, because they gave him the option of going to Rooty Hill, and he said he'd love to be here. So thank you very much, <laughs> Sid. He has lived on the northwest coast of Tasmania since 1975, is married and has two sons, and lives in the village of Forth in a cottage built in 1875. He did tell me earlier as well that he's a huge fan of musical theatre. His favourite show? Sweeney Todd. Now, does anybody, has anyone seen Sweeney Todd? Hands up again. Seen the movie, maybe? Do you know what it's about? It's about someone who makes pies out of humans. So maybe that's your future on a plate. I don't know. I found it interesting that that's what Sid chose as his favourite musical. So to give us an introduction and to tell us uh, a little bit of the government's thinking on this, would you please welcome the Honourable Sid Sidebottom. I was going to say, thanks very much. I was going to say, I'm from the government. So here we are. Um, may I first uh, uh, thank you all very much uh, for being here for this, the final session, and uh, for your interest in all things ag. I can't think of a more exciting and interesting area to be involved in and to have you here sharing with us. And may I also say to our panellists, uh, here, thank you very, very much for your contributions. Uh, fantastic uh, uh, biographies and interests and expertise. And uh, I know Rod, and thank you very much for, for doing your part in this. We'll explore those a little bit uh, later on. Um, I noticed that the, the title was uh, Our Future on a Plate. And it just struck me that that analogy is very Western, and I wonder if it's really appropriate could it be our future in a bowl rather than a plate? Uh, and maybe that's something worth contemplating as well. Anyway, we're exploring in detail how Australia will respond to the challenges of global demand until the year 2050. Not that far away, lit actually. From literally grassroots level, looking th at through to looking at the bigger picture. Now, I was going to point out the fantastic uh, position that agriculture has in our economy, but the Minister and others have already done that. All I want to say is it is highly, highly significant. And when we're talking about innovation uh, and industry uh, and uh, exciting prospects, agriculture has it all, and all those involved with agriculture. Now, I don't need to remind many of you in this room that we also face many challenges. Um, we have to produce more food and fibre to feed a growing population with a smaller rural workforce. We have to contribute to the overall growth in developing countries 
and to adopt more efficient and sustainable production methods, all the while adjusting to many factors, including, and importantly, climate change. In producing more and increasing productivity, it needs to continually skill those who are already in the industry, attract future skilled people, and in so doing, compete with other dynamic industries for these people. That is a huge challenge. The two-speed economy in Australia, with the accompanying high Australian dollar, which we all hear about, tied closely very much to the mining boom, has affected in no small way or manner export income to the food and fibre industry. Indeed, I noticed in a report by the Australian Institute just recently, still beating around the bush, which is a great title, it reckons this to be 61.1, or sorry, 61.5 billion in export income uh, since 2003 and 4, 61.5 billion dollars. Um, now, a good example of big picture thinking, and we want to be positive here, is the National Farmers Federation's recently released blueprint for Australian agriculture 2013 to 2020. And it sets out a strong and sustainable future path for Australian agriculture and its supply chain. And looking ahead at least to 2020 and towards 2050. Now the blueprint, and I won't go into too much detail, adopts seven themes and it correctly concludes with what I think is a self-evident and necessary challenge. And I'd like to share this with you. The agricultural sector in Australia has a choice to approach this future in a fragmented way or to make more of the opportunity by forging closer cooperation. We always talk about this when we have gatherings of Aggies, right? We have to do it if we're to be part of the future bowl. Another example, and I hope you may have heard of this, is the Agri-Food 2025 initiative, 2025 plus initiative to come out of Western Australia. This is part of a vision that's looking over the horizon and talking about some of the challenges and opportunities for the sector over the next few decades. Now, the department in Western Australia have developed this Agri-Food 2025 plus, the future way, and it's very clever. The, the way is spelt capital W, capital A with a small y. Now, this is a consultative scenario-based initiative to examine future opportunities for a globally competitive agriculture and food industry. And the reason I'm raising it is one, to share that with you, but also they're looking at three ways, spelled capital W, A, capital, capital W, capital A and small y, to achieve the vision that is through the farm tech way, the gourmet way and the global supermarket way. So I urge you all to have a look at Agri-Food 2025 plus. It's very clever and of course very much part and parcel of the theme. Now we talk about the Asian century and looking beyond our shores, Asia's rise is changing the world in front of us. This rise will have profound implications for people everywhere. Asia's extraordinary ascent has already changed the Australian economy, our society and strategic environment. Within only a few years, Asia will not only be the world's largest producer of goods and services, it will also be the world's largest consumer of them, that's China and the Asian counterparts. This presents an extraordinary opportunity for Australia and you've heard about this. We're regarded as clever producers and service providers, but I would add we also need to be smart. We need to be smart and clever in increasing productivity. We need to be smart and clever in maintaining and attracting a skilled workforce and providing career pathways. Career pathways, not just jobs, career pathways. And we also need to be clever and smart in, in accessing, engaging, understanding and supplying Asian markets, plural, rather than seeing one, two or three commodity markets. The visions that I outlined, just the two I just mentioned, above recognise the difference and the need for both. So while our future is not guaranteed, we can look forward to 2025 and onwards from a position of relative strength. There is a plate 
or a bowl. Our role and extent of our future is largely in our hands and there are no guarantees, only opportunities, and we are and should be well positioned to achieve these. It is clever and it is smart. Now, I had a lot more to say, but look, I think that's enough to get the ball rolling. And I do thank you very much for your attendance and I look forward to hearing those that know a lot more than I and they're my fellow panellists. So thanks very much. Let's stay smart. Let's stay clever. Cheers. Thank you very much and once again thank you so much for making time in your schedule to be here today. Now just a note that um, what we're going to do to begin is I'll ask all the panellists individually to just to give us one or two ideas that they have about the future of food or the, the, to address the topic, the future on a plate. So I'll do that individually and then after that we'll start a general discussion and we certainly want to hear questions from the floor and there is a special uh, prize following the uh, Outlook Conference at six, from six to eight tonight there is, uh, there is drinks at the Canberra Museum and Gallery put on by uh, Nuffield Australia and free drinks to anyone who asks a question. So please, if you, uh, the drinks are free anyway, but we would really like to really uh, encourage you to have you know, your questions answered this afternoon. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Ramesh Chand, Director of the National Centre for Agricultural Economics and Policy Research on, of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, PhD in Agricultural Economics from Indian Agricultural Research Institute in New Delhi, and a list of um, achievements, not too long to list here, but certainly too long for me to read today. So we are really honoured to have you here and thank you so much. He did tell me earlier, doesn't worry if we mention that we're two nil down on the cricket, he's not a cricket fan, but he's a very passionate volleyballer. So thank you very much, Dr. Ramesh Chand. And if you could just begin, you can stay in your seat, please, and just tell us what you think is perhaps the number one thing that you are concerned about or the number one challenge or the number one opportunity for the future? Thank you. Um, in fact, I would uh, like uh, this future on plate to be considered in terms of future from plough to plate. If we don't look at plough, we will not be able to secure our future in food. Why I say so, because our analysis shows that in the past, it was production which was having a dominant role on what will be prices. But last 10 years are showing that it is other way around. It is the prices that farmer receive which determine what will be the production. So if we don't pay attention to integrating food supply, ensuring that farmers get remunerative prices, we will not be able to serve future on plate. The second thing I would like to say that uh, according to FAO and many other international agency, and I make this statement with responsibility, have been giving wrong signal that if food prices go up, one billion people will go undernourished, all those things. Actual FAO statistics show, SOFI, State of Food Insecurity, that after 2005, when food prices increased, the hunger has declined in the world. The undernutrition has declined in the world. Why so? Because high prices received high supply response, more production. So what matter more for food security is adequate production, not cheap food prices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramesh Chand. Now, our next uh, guest is uh, the next panelist, Philip Glide from the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. He's a very, very keen cyclist. In fact, would you like to hold your hand up, hold your arm up and show us he's still wearing his Live Strong uh, armband or wristband, so very good. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, your thoughts, your, your concerns, your opportunities, your challenges. Um, thanks, Rod. Um, I'm the other representative of government. I'm the less charismatic one. Uh, my parliamentary secretary is the charismatic uh, representative of government. But my role in the industry essentially is I, I drive a desk, I manage an intray, and into that intro comes on a regular basis lots of bright ideas 
about improving Australian agriculture and fisheries. Um, our role as a department is to work to improve the competitiveness and sustainability of Australia's agriculture and fisheries industries. So the questions I try to ask myself when I open up my emails or start driving my in-tray in the, in the morning is, is three questions. When I look at each of these bright ideas, or some of them are good, some of them are not so good, will this be something that will improve the productivity of the Australian uh, farming and fishing industry? Will it be something that will improve our access to overseas markets because we are fundamentally dependent on those if we are to grow our industry? Or will it contribute to the ongoing sustainability of this in industry from an environmental and a social licence operate perspective? So they're the three questions I try to ask when I'm driving my desk. And they're the things I think we all need to focus on. If you think back to what Paul Morris said in his opening uh, overview statement, there's plenty of potential in Asia, and, but it ain't going to be easy. We're not going to just get higher prices. Uh, we have to work very hard in order to be able to capture those opportunities from our competitors. Philip, thank you very much. So already it seems a bit of a theme is running here, and that is the balance of price and affordability. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Our next guest, our next panelist this, uh, this afternoon is Duncan Fraser, <coughs> Vice President of the National Farmers Federation. Um, also uh, his family farm, which is uh, in the Western Riverina, produces wool, sheep, meat, rice and wheat. So covering a, a lot of that there. Duncan, what would you like to discuss this afternoon? Uh, thank you, Rod. Uh, I'd just like to uh, highlight some key pillars of our uh, platform to government, given that this is an election year. And the first pillar is reprioritising Australian agriculture. We are seeking a much higher priority in research and development and, and education. We seek an improvement in awareness and understanding of agriculture, both at a political level and at the community level. And obviously we, as a facilitator of the blueprint, for Australian agriculture, we uh, would uh, be pushing for implementation of the blueprint, which is still a work in progress. It's owned by everyone. We've facilitated that at an NFLF level, but it's, uh, everyone has ownership over it. The second pillar is uh, investing in research and development and extension. It's been proven that there are positive returns on investment with the increase in research and development expenditure. So uh, agriculture has the runs on the board there but uh, it has lapsed in uh, recent years. We'll be seeking um, at least two or three new CRCs, ag-based CRCs, so revitalising of the uh, CRCs, and would be encouraging private co-investment. Third pillar would be increasing competitiveness and profitability. That's to reverse the declining terms of trade um, through uh, reducing red tape or, and green tape that we've all heard about harmonisation of uh, state and federal uh, laws, and we're seeing that happening in the, um, with regard to the uh, mining sector and um, agriculture. The issue of ageing infrastructure and the need for investment there, and trade and market access, and uh, we've heard this about uh, the need to, uh, to get more uh, free trade agreements um, signed, and there's biosecurity issues. Uh, and fourth pillar is the stronger workforce. And that's to address the challenges to the workforce development, uh, increase the content of agriculture in the school curricula, uh, flexibility of workplace agreements. And so what I look at, all these pillars surrounding that is, is engaging people in how we do that. And it's something we haven't done very well in agriculture in the past, and, and we really uh, need to improve that and, uh, and make the awareness through uh, engagement of people. So essentially, the challenges to governments is now is the time to set the framework for 2030 and beyond and to get it right. And in the uh, words of Dr. Stephen Wright, a well-known scientist, if at first you don't succeed, then don't take up skydiving. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Duncan, thank you very much. He's also a very keen aviator and about 20 years ago uh, took Tony Abbott for a flight, I believe. They both oh, landed safely. Go. <laughs> now to our next panellist, Michael Croft. Unusually perhaps for uh, perhaps people here at this conference, he's a first generation farmer and looks at things in a very, very different way. Uh, look, 
If you tell me what vertical integration means, we all have a different idea about that, but Michael's uh, is a very interesting one. Value adding, paddock to plate, um, and from not far away, I don't think. So he's also a huge fan of Winston Churchill. Never give up, never give up, never give up. So uh, Michael Croft, what are your plans? What are your hopes, dreams, visions for the future? Well, um, yeah, that's working. Firstly, um, I have to declare a conflict of interest. I'm a farmer, um, but also I'm a trained economist and studied economic history at the ANU. So uh, they're not mutually exclusive, I'll have you know. Um, I've actually got a bigger concern, and my concern is that we've got it all wrong. And um, all the indicators that I'm looking at, and the ones that I've heard here today or over the last two days, indicate to me that the world actually produces too much food. And Australia does as well. So if we look at um, the FAO and UN, and you, and I'll quote Olivia de Schutter, um, who is a special rapporteur on the right to food, in 2008, when the food price crisis hit, we produced enough food for 12 billion people. Now, that's interesting because at the time, there was, the population was 6.7 billion. And yet we had, nine, at the time, 925 million that were chronically malnourished. And for those of you who think that hunger is not enough food, why is it that in Australia we have two million people that are food insecure, that is, go to bed one day a week without food, when we produce enough food for three times our population? So I guess I'm wondering whether we've got it all wrong. Um, and if we have, all the fundamental assumptions we've made about productivity and production increases, etc., will actually make the matter worse. So that's, I'm just running up a flag there, just to be a bit challenging. Okay. Thank you. Very provocative, and thank you very much for that, uh, Michael Croft. Um, our next panellist is Georgie Somerset. Uh, Georgie Somerset is um, from Kingaroy. Uh, a beef farmer, rural leader with experience in agribusiness, uh, rural tourism and regional development, and her work involves identifying opportunities, resolving issues and creating linkages and networks across rural sectors. I'm sure we'll find out what that means because I, th I find it fascinating. Um, it's a family-owned beef uh, property and she's also got breaking news on Richard III, Georgie Somerset. Yeah, we have. <laughs> they've, they've found Richard III's skeleton. They're now looking for his horse and they've started digging up the Tesco car park. Boom, boom. So, so moving on, um, look, I grow beef, but what I do is I take some really variable elements, which is uh, rain, we've got a little bit too much of it at the moment, sunshine, uh, I have native grasses. I manage that variability with a machine, which is my cattle, and I produce beef. But it's the managing the variability which is a really critical part of my business. And for me, the future is going to rely on people and investing in people for our productivity and our profitability. And all the things that have been mentioned over the last day or so keep coming back to people to enact them. We can have all the science, the research, the technology, the information, but unless we invest in strategic thinking skills, unless we invest in leadership programs, both at a, a national, a state, and a local level, unless we're prepared to invest in our staff and our people and ourselves, we won't actually be able to take that information and use it effectively. So I think to ensure that we actually have a future on a plate or a bowl or however it's served, agriculture relies completely on people and we have to invest in them for the future. Georgie, thank you very much. Also from the South Burnett area is Don Madden, partner and director of Smithfield Feedlot, family owned and operated cattle enterprise based in the South Burnett region of Queensland. He also, loves black caviar. And we're not talking about the thing you eat with a mother of pearl spoon. He's a mad horse racing fan. Horses are very popular in the beef cattle industry at the moment. Um, <laughs> Don, what would you like to discuss this afternoon? Yeah, nothing like horse substitution anyway. That's, that's getting a bit of a theme of a joke. Um, now, I've, I've sort of uh, listened to a few points uh, over the period of uh, this conference and um, I'm, uh, I'm from the school of, uh, of enterprise-driven agriculture. 
Uh, I believe a lot of the progress in agriculture over the centuries have been driven by the enterprise of the individuals doing it. Um, I'm concerned in the future where modern affluent Western society seems to have an obsession with peasant farming. Uh, my potato picking Irish forebears would roll in their collective graves if I were to suggest to them their peasant lifestyle was somehow a better way of producing food than what we do now. So I'm uh, seeing that Progress in agriculture is going to be driven by innovation. Uh, it's got to be science-based. Uh, the beauty of agriculture, and it's what makes me passionate about it, it's applied science in its purest form. We get to work with animals. We get to use technology and science and observe the evolution of these animals to produce food for people. And we get to repeat it, and we get to do it every day and see the results. So. Uh, I think food in the future will always revolve around the age-old concept of su supply and demand economics. If the demand for food continues to rise, agriculture will produce it. Thank you very much for that. Now, uh, Don was the 2010 Nuffield Scholar. The 2009 Nuffield Scholar is uh, Jennifer Hawkins. She uh, operates a mixed irrigation property in Finlay in the Riverina of New South Wales. Uh, prime lambs, beef cattle, wheat, canola, and proudly can tell you that her son Tom has won at least two premierships with Geelong. That's very exciting, Jennifer, and congratulations for that. Um, your thoughts, your vision for the future, your concerns? Thank you very much. Um, I suppose. Um, one of the things, and some of my points have already been covered a little bit, but it's just going to be a slightly different slant, is really the unpredictability of the environment um, really means to me that not all um, of our farming decisions will be profitable. And um, I suppose it, it's often seen to be as a balance between demonstrating our family's integrity in farming um, with it making enough money to be able to guarantee and cement our future. Um, the issues that I've noted are that it will be things like being smart or an entrepreneurial type of management, technology, um, R&D that will drive Jack and my business into the future. Um, government policy both domestically and globally um, and climate variability we rate as our number one uh, risks. And, um, and, and certainly our greatest future risks, and the ones that are most difficult, obviously, to manage. Um, I'd like to see the E put back into R&D, because I'll simply put it that extension is the key, and without it, we won't make it. As an Australian farmer, um, it's not just my response, I suppose, to those initial things in agriculture, but all my, also um, my influence as a woman, that will also be essential to the provision of food into 2030 and 2050. Each generation I know um, seeks to improve the, the world of their children. And so I give you the answer to this agricultural red re revolution that we face for the future. And it's simply put, it's women. The FAO estimates that women produce over 50% of all food grown worldwide and 80% in to 90% in developing countries. People's overall access to food is very dependent on the work of rural women. And they are also, women themselves are responsible for purchasing, consuming, delivering, cooking, and are the nutritional overseers of the world's food. In most communities, women hold the most reliable knowledge about promoting food security preserving threatened food supplies and ensuring their family, family survival in, um, er, in times of shortage. Their access to financial services, agricultural extension, education, healthcare and human rights are therefore very important things to assuring food security in, in our world and most of all, developing our farming integrity. Jennifer, thank you very much for that. Okay, so we'll open it up to questions in a moment, but there is something I do want to start with, and that is, was, was a recurring theme. But it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that 
food prices basically now are at a historical low. We pay less for food than at any time in history. Are we about to see the end of cheap food in uh, the world and maybe in Australia? And um, how can we continue to pay farmers affordable living, affordable wages, affordable prices, um, if that food price continues to be low? Or are we looking now at a huge spike in the price of food in Australia and indeed for the, the food that we produce to send uh, to other countries around the world? And by all means, everyone jump in. If anyone's got anything to say about this, please jump in. And then I would love it if other people would uh, uh, jump in and also contradict or put their own views. So please go right ahead. Whoever would like to start on that, go right ahead. I'd yeah. Like, I'd like, like to repeat that price is a, is a result of demand and supply. Um, if the demand's there and the supply is not, the price will go up and the market will, cr will react. Um, I, I think the danger is because we've become so efficient in our markets and, and the death of prices is overproduction and oversupply. Uh, we've become so efficient in our, in our storages and our markets that short-term interruptions to the supply, uh, the danger is governments and institutions stepping in and trying to manage those short terms and not allowing the market to correct. Philip, would you like to comment on that? What should the government do in a situation like this? Um, I guess I'd say we'd uh, continue to see the market operate. Um, what's just been said is absolutely right. And also, I don't know if those of you around here yesterday, um, the ABS did some work. Uh, it was looking at what might happen to food prices out to 2050, and their prediction was that they're pretty much going to be flat if slightly increasing, uh, that was seen as a bit of a, a negative, but that's probably the reality because when, as uh, was said earlier on, uh, when prices go up, farmers respond um, and uh, produce more and prices come down. So uh, there's a number of factors that ABARES went into, but I think the thesis that we're, we're gonna see the um, end of low prices and we're gonna see lots of continually high prices over time is just not right. Michael, I wonder if you could just comment on that as well because you have a different look at you know, how you produce. You're not producing on a huge level, you're producing on a much smaller very, very level, and how's to. it going to affect you? Yep, very, very happy to. Um, well, basically, I'm a proud peasant farmer. So just... Uh, <laughs> and frankly, I don't care what's happening to international commodity prices because I deal directly with my end user as a... Well, more than that, we're actually a tillage-to-toilet production system because we take into account food waste. We actually get waste back onto the farm, but that's another issue. So we get a five times price premium for our pork, we get a three times price premium for our lamb, we get a two times price premium for our beef, and we get 100% of the retail price. So I don't have a problem um, with overproduction because my clients are loyal to me. Basically what I've done is I've developed a niche market, but that is in response to a glut. That's the important thing. So it's back to a glut. There's a glut of food out there. A niche market's a response to a glut. An obesity epidemic's a response to a glut. Being price takers is a response to a glut. There's a glut of food, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Ramesh Chand, is there a glut of food in India? Pardon? <coughs> Pardon? Is there a glut of food in India? It's not uh, glut of food in India. In fact, uh, uh, we were facing deceleration in agriculture growth from uh, 95 to 2005 when terms of trade for agriculture was deteriorating. But from five onward, the, the uh, price environment improved and agriculture growth also improved. So now we are uh, having uh, about 3.6% growth rate in agriculture. Uh, we have uh, bumper production of uh, some of the commodities last uh, two, three years, uh, particularly beet, rice, cotton. But 1230, it will be little less because like Australian agriculture, our agriculture also largely depends on rainfall, monsoon. So 1230, this our, our uh, uh, growth rate in agriculture will be less than 2% and our food grain production is going to decline from 258 million ton to 250 uh, million ton. Uh, we do not have glut, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there is some mismatch between what is required for consumption and what is being produced. Uh, 
Okay. Our government is giving excessive importance in policy and development to cereals, whereas more emphasis is needed on horticultural commodities, on uh, fisheries, on uh, livestock activities. But in India, we are obsessed with food security, and food security is further narrowed down to rice and wheat security. So as long as our go down, buffer stock are full, flowing, overflowing with rice and wheat, we feel very comfortable. We don't feel so much concerned about uh, pulses. You see, they are, they are main source of protein. And we are uh, deficit to the extent of 30%. So, so we need to uh, change our priority. Of course, we have uh, excess over consumption or demand in uh, cereals. But we are deficit in pulses, and we are importing 10 million tons of edible oils. So there we have shortage. OK. Sid Sidebottom, what role should the government have, do you think, in a more equitable distribution of food in Australia, given that we've heard that you know, two million people don't know literally where their next meal's coming from? What happens? What should we do? Um, well, again, um, I, I, can't, I don't doubt the figures, but uh, it's interesting um, that it was uh, put as such as that. Um, we produce enough food. Um, our policy is that uh, that food be accessible and that it be nutritious and that it be available. Um, our market operates uh, so that people can have access to that um, and uh, it is supplied as such. The fact that people, if people are not having access to nutritious food, it may be uh, clearly a question of uh, ability to, in terms of income. And we have a safety net system which exists in this country mm -hmm. uh, to allow people to at least to have access to finance right. to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. So um, our policy parameters are there. How, it's, how uh, people use those, well, it's, it's very much an individual case. But OK, Philip wants to jump in from the department here. Um, I was just going to say that uh, this is a really significant issue as far as our consultations on the National Food Plan are concerned. And uh, when you begin to, to dig into it and those figures is, are correct, it does seem amazing that in a, uh, a country that does have an obesity epidemic that we do have uh, quite a lot of people who do go to, go to bed hungry every night. And when you look at how you might do something about it, is, it the question is what is the role of the agriculture industry in that. Uh, there's a lot of complex factors that go to um, uh, a whole lot of other issues to do with uh, income, poverty, getting, escaping poverty traps, um, how we, how we uh, manage indigenous issues, etc. So there's a lot of complexity about that and it is a really wicked problem to solve okay. and I'm not sure how agriculture alone uh, ac can deal with that, that, some okay. of those issues. I want to go ahead, you know, maybe 30, 40 years, and uh, Jennifer Hawkins, you talked a lot about research and development. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, it seems, from what I've read, about artificial food and how we should really be starting to embrace artificial food. Uh, is that where research and development should be heading, do you think? No, no, I think that, um, I mean, it can. Yeah. I mean, the market will, some of the markets will determine and, and people's choice will determine. That's not for me to prescribe that. But I suppose from our farming production system and from um, Australian agriculture, I think one of the things about our food is is that um, we might we talked about it earlier about an oversupply. But in in my backyard, I do all the budgets one year, and you know those things come out of left field. You know, like environmental issues, like floods, like fires, like whatever. I mean, there are natural constraints that that can impact on agriculture both in Australia and overseas. So to me, the research and development that would be critical to my, to my operation is working with those environment, that, that, that climate variability that I have and helping to reduce its impacts and manage it as a risk. Okay. Um, so, you know, really, I'd be looking at trying to look at more drought tolerant, um, more water sensitive, more temperature sensitive, um, uh, production systems. Okay, Georgie? Well, I just think we've got to be, it comes back to investing in people and we're looking at 30 years time, we've actually got to be courageous about what we're doing now. So there is no one 
part of the community that could come up with the solutions for two million people going hungry each night in Australia. Yes, we have food cheaper than it's ever been before, and, and the outlook is not that that's going to increase. So let's try and match those things. But this is where I come back to, we need some, some braveness and some courageousness with our leadership. And we need to make sure that we're actually scaffolding people who want to put their hand up to do things differently, to collaborate, to work with government and community industry, to get some cross-sectoral things going. This is, this is what I talk about, Rod, in terms of working across sectors. Too often agriculture goes, well, we'll just deal with the agricultural problems and, and we'll do that. And the community sector's over here saying, but we're trying to feed two million people every night. And we still need to be productive. I mean, my thing is about managing the variability that Jennifer talked about. Deal with that day in, day out. But we also need to be working with government to make sure that the economic framework, the environmental framework is there. We need to work with the community sector to make sure that we're there. But it's going to take people who are prepared to step outside their silo, their boxes, and they need some support to do that. There's a blueprint there. Duncan's talked about the blueprint. Who's read the blueprint? Who's prepared to give Duncan a call and say, I'll give you a hand with this? I mean, I floated an idea where I'd love to see a gap year program um, where Australian agriculturalists offer a gap program where young people can go out and work in agriculture for a year before they go on to be accountants and lawyers and policy makers and marketers. And wouldn't that be fantastic because they'd have an understanding of what we do and maybe move them through some industries. But I floated that in November last year and I'm yet to have anyone come back to me and say that's a good idea. So people Well, we'd like to hear to from respond. the National Farmers uh, Federation on yep. that. Uh, thanks, Rod. I, I see parallels with this argument uh, with the oil industry in, back in the 1970s. And I'm saying um, the production of crude oil, I'd equate with uh, climatic factors. So back then when OPEC um, cut back the um, production of crude oil, what we saw was a dramatic increase in fuel prices, which also led to a flurry of investment R&D into improving technology into alternative or more efficient um, engines, but also alternatives. And uh, you could, you'd see the parallels here with agriculture, but it would be um, climatic factors that would cause um, uh, a rise in uh, food costs, which would in turn lead to an increase in R&D. And I would hope that it would be more forward thinking than to react that to uh, increasing our R&D extension expenditure just based on rising fuel prices because people are upset by um, suddenly finding that uh, the cheap food that they'd got used to mm -hmm. uh, was no longer there. And it really comes back to this awareness that um, uh, while food remains relatively cheap, uh, too many of our consumers just take it for granted and, they, and it makes it more difficult to improve the awareness of, of how the food is produced and the longer term ramifications of that and especially with you know the simple factor is we're going to have to look to do things better with diminishing resources okay well and water. just on that and please anyone jump in on this you know i've been reading about these bioreactors that um placed in the desert uh could require one percent of the land two percent of the water and uh, 90 percent reduction in greenhouse gases we're growing artificial meat and that is in 2035 we will have a massive shortage of real meat. When you say we've got to do things differently, are we always going to be wedded to real food rather than possibly artificial food? Anyone else, please jump in. These ideas have been kicked around since Malthus 400 years ago. Sure. And he's been wrong at That's where I read about it. <laughs> and he's been wrong at every turn. You don't feel that now it's a little different given that when climate change is real and it's happening right now that we're going to have, a look, have to look at things. We're looking about your future on a plate in 30 years' time, not 400 years ago. Market and prices will stimulate okay. a solution. Always have. The market will always look for a solution? Yes, price, okay. price will stimulate a solution. Okay. That's, That's what fine. it does. Anyone else on that? Michael? Um, <coughs> will the market always provide a solution? Can I um, give you a story about, about the market? Please do. Yep. Um, it concerns a friend of mine, and a uh, really nice guy, and uh, Peter's his name. Uh, Griffith is where he comes from. He's a citrus grower. And uh, last year, he was getting $100 a tonne for his oranges, and he was paying $70 a tonne to pick them, just to pick them. So what he did was uh, he bulldozed 10 hectares of naval oranges into the ground 
pushed them over into a corner, then got his son, who started working on the farm, to light the fire while he went home and attempted suicide. Luckily, he didn't succeed. Now, that is a response to a price signal, a highly inappropriate response to a price signal. So, what he's doing now is he's driving from Griffith to the farmer's markets, where he gets a dollar a kilogram for his oranges. Now, that's $1,000 a tonne. That's a 10 times price premium on what he was getting. Because he's dealing direct, he's bypassed this long chain distribution system, which is actually causing all sorts of problems. Now, he's not, he's a, he's a success story, but I just want to say that the market does send signals, but they're not always appropriate. Before we open it up to some questions, just one question for anyone, and again, please jump in. This is about your future on a plate. If we were to look 30 years in the future, given that if we look 30 years in the past, we're not eating now what we were eating 30 years ago. Tastes have changed, the market has changed. Um, you know, we're eating more foods from overseas, uh, not only unknowingly or certainly whether we know, yeah, whether we know it or not. Um, what will we be eating in 30 years' time and will we still be paying roughly the same amount? Ramesh? Um, I believe it is science and innovation which shape future. It is science and innovation which uh, shaped uh, food in the past, and it is science and innovation which will shape food future as well. But though we have a lot of science in agriculture, but I would say that compared to other fields, if we look at space, if we look at medical science, if we look at engineering, we are not seeing that kind of science in agriculture. In my country, I used to say to my fellow agriculture scientists that you look at any field, like, uh, like engineering. Ten years back, if a car runs five kilometers with one liter of petrol, now it runs ten kilometers. Mm. Ten years back, if one computer or refrigerator comes with $2,000, now it is available for $1,000. We are not seeing that kind of science in agriculture, that 10 years back, we used to produce 5 kg of beet for 1 kg of nitrogen. Are we producing now 8 kg of uh, beet for 1 kg of nitrogen? Unless that kind of thing happened, the future would be really under threat. Because in future, we cannot afford to ignore efficiency and sustainability that we need to produce more with lesser sources. We need to produce more taking into account sustainability and stressed environment. So I feel for future that science matters. And incidentally, most of the world, most of the particularly developing country, they are not investing enough in agriculture R&D. Okay. Georgie, someone said? Oh, look, I agree. I mean, you know, we, need to, we need to continue. I mean, we've had incredible productivity gains based on research and development, but also on the extension of that. So actually taking the research, again, through people, putting it out into productivity. That has flatlined for the last probably 10 years. It's probably 20 years since we've had some real breakthroughs in areas. So unless we invest in science, it's going to be very difficult to, to do that. I'm not convinced that in 30 years it's going to be that different from what we're doing now. Yes, tastes might have changed. Things might, the balance of what we eat might be a little bit different, but I look back 30 years and in fact, um, there is more understanding of food and mm -hmm. nutrition and I mean, we have more obesity, but we understand more about it. This, this food literacy thing is very confusing and where some of that goes in terms of a health perspective and how agriculture works with the health industry and the food industry is another whole um, dilemma for the next 30 years, but I'm actually not convinced. I mean, 20 years ago, everyone said we wouldn't have kitchens. Now I'm seeing mega kitchens. It was going to be that everything would be packaged and we'd just buy our meals off the shelf and that was the way we had to go and we had to look at meals that could just be pre-prepared. Yes, we've got pre-prepared meals now, but we've also got huge kitchens. So, you know, I'm not convinced that in 30 years' time the actual makeup of the food is going to be significantly different. What will happen is that the people doing this, um, the producers, are actually going to hold a whole lot smarter because, as Don said, the market's going to request that we do that. We're going to have to keep supplying. Australians don't expect to pay a lot for food, um, but Australian farmers, for whatever reason, manage to keep producing food at an exceptionally high standard, 
day in, day out, so that Australians can be well fed, um, apart from the, the two million. But the food is actually available there for those people. It's how we link their access to it. So I, okay. I'm not convinced it's going to be different food, but I do think we've got to invest in that science and technology to make sure that the producers can actually manage the variability in the middle there um, even, even more. OK, I have a rule, and that is once three people leave, we open it up to questions from the audience. So I've counted one, two, three people have left. I don't know why, because I think we're just starting to get interesting. Um, we have four microphones. Please use them. We have a question uh, at uh, microphone number one. Please identify yourself if you feel the need to and direct your question at whoever you would like. Uh, Jolyon Burnett from the Macadamia Society. Georgie, I don't know that Duncan um, responded to your or, or to the uh, question about whether he supported your rural gap year idea. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, but I am concerned, uh, having three children who've just gone through gap years uh, in the last three years myself, they seem to either go to Tibet and build school rooms or they go to uh, Bali or Byron near me and, and become a complete pest and nuisance for everybody who's, uh, who's around them. How would you actually get them uh, to undertake a rural gap year, short of, you know, uh, conscription? <laughs> That'll Good. do. Yeah, that's fine. And can I also uh, we used, to, we used to have it, it was called sorry. national service. Uh, look, I actually think that it is a potential thing. I think that it's all about marketing. I mean, kids pay to go to Tibet and build a school. They pay to go and work in a boarding school in England or Canada. and you know, they. they would welcome the opportunity, I believe, to go and work in agriculture. But one of the dilemmas is that industry says it's too much of a problem, it's too hard. Um, we'd just be spending all our time teaching them about what we do and then they'd ping off back to the city and we wouldn't have the skills. What I'm saying is that's actually an investment in our future because we have people who understand what our industry does and what it is. So as an industry, as producers, we actually have to take some responsibility of bearing that cost of, of educating them as well. Isn't it the case, though, that we do have gap agricultural years, but in fact it's people from overseas who are spending their gap year working in on yeah, our farms and orchards and things like that? Well, yeah, we do, Rod. People do come out here. And we also do have, in the pastoral industry, there are a whole lot of young people in the Northern Territory right at the moment doing their induction. And they'll go, many of them will go on to uni next year, having done a year in the Northern Territory. Um, but we do have many more overseas people who come out here either for a gap year or post-grad year. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, anyone else? Please. I, we, uh, we employ, we're from a small town of about 300 people. Um, we have 40 employees. That would make you think it's going to be pretty hard to find employment in that sort of business. We actually don't have too much trouble. We recruit out of universities every year. We put on a trainee manager, usually with a degree either in agribusiness or ag science every year. We've done it for the last 10. And last year I had 70 applicants for that one job. I, I, I don't prescribe that there's a huge lack of people willing. It's, it's just that you've got to have the product there to attract them. Is and it it's about yeah. the career path. Yeah. Is it something government wants to get involved with? Yeah, look, um, look as an outsider um, coming... How are we going? You right? Yeah. yeah. Um, as an outsider coming in to the industry, I don't, don't belong to it as such. Can you hear it OK? Yeah, we're fine. Yeah, sorry. Um, one of the things I find interesting is even now at our um, universities, and I don't wish to just single that them out, there's been an increase in the number of people taking courses in agriculture. Uh, we also know in my discussions with TAFE, and particularly Go TAFE in Victoria, an increase in the number of people taking up skilled qualifications. But why is this? Well, some say that the drought has broken, literally. I would also say that the industry, and it comes through particularly in discussions with uh, farming organisations, is it's the language we use and the way we frame our industry and our industries that are so important, and that means that we for once talk about opportunities. We don't lack challenges. In fact, you know, you see the cross-armed, hairy-armed, serious-looking farmer type, all right, representing our industries as articulators. I'm not sure that should be the case. I don't see any of them here today. No? Well, 
<laughs> it's a very good point. I remember having a discussion with the local school. Um, their, their idea, they want us to get involved in their ag studies they were, they were promoting at the school. And I was told by the headmaster and the, and the head of curriculum that agriculture will be something really good to have the kids who have difficulty learning and don't want to be involved in class. And I said, right. we need people who've got maths, English, and all the skills they need because they're the skills we want in agriculture. Thank you for, oh, yep. Uh, that's the attitude of, course, of the Education National education. Farmers Federation. Thank you. Uh, just while well, speaking also as a, from a personal perspective, and uh, the blueprint is f uh, for everyone, so we're happy to look at, uh, at the NFF about uh, these sort of concepts of um, agricultural gap years. but. I, I see the uptake of um, gap years in agriculture as, as part of an issue with um, uh, the problems we've had with the folding up of a lot of our ag colleges. And as Jim Gelt and I well know, having been on advisory councils of ag colleges, we've seen almost the systematic um, dismantling of many of the ag colleges uh, that provided pathways for, um, for students from year 11 upwards to be able to progress into agricultural uh, education. And that's been um, you know, really disheartening and, and sad. And, uh, and I think that um, it's limiting the opportunities for uh, a lot of um, students to, um, to, to get into uh, further training. Uh, and it's something that really does need to be addressed. And, uh, and it comes back to getting agricultural into the school curriculums to um, to foster that uh, engagement and attachment of, of students to agriculture and um, then hopefully the demand will be there to, um, to look at uh, uh, a greater variety of ways of doing it. But um, yep, um, gap years are, uh, are, are great, but um, you know, there, there's other ways too. Okay, we might move on and come back to that if we uh, can, but we have another question. But, no, oh, I have number six, I'm sorry, okay. Yes, far away. Uh, Gordon McCauley, Grain Growers. Um, I'd like to address a question to Michael, because um, re recently I looked at uh, an FAO report which sort of indicated across the world we waste something like 30 to 50% of our agricultural production, which I think you were probably addressing. Um, I think it hinted at that in developed countries one of the major loss areas was uh, used by dates, and in developing countries, it was largely the handling and transport and storage and distribution systems. I'd very much like to get your reaction to what's, what's the chance that we will actually do something about all of that, which will then have a major impact on our food production and consumption systems. So are you advocating getting rid of use by dates? No, I'm just saying that that's what the FAO report uh, pointed to. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. Michael. In the in the third world, um, it's referred to as post-production losses, and uh, basically in the developed world, it's referred to as post-consumer waste, and that's generally where it is. In Australia, it's roughly 40% um, of all food we produce is actually thrown out, and um, there is confusion. We need we need a literacy program around best before, um, uh, use by, and because people actually confuse the two. And um, so th there needs to be some clarification around that. But um, look, every state government, I believe, every state government has a end waste, New South Wales, it's love food, haste waste, hate waste program. Um, there is a concern though, and uh, this is something to ponder because these are wicked problems. If Australia manages to end its 40% food waste, what's that going to do to food prices in Australia when 40% more food's available? That's just a question I've got. So th these are wicked problems. So it's a great idea. I actually 100% support ending waste. But when we actually have 40% more food, food in Australia, what does that do to prices? Okay. Anyone question. else? I just, to I just want to talk on the food waste. I, I had the opportunity to speak at the Sydney Festival on food waste and, and there were sort of 1,200 people registered from the city of Sydney to come and talk about food waste. If, if you go and buy five bags of groceries, as you're walking out of the grocery shop, just put one of those in the rubbish bin because that's basically what each of you, on average, would waste each week. 
So the challenge we put out was that it's actually not about any of us doing something, it's about each individual doing something about food waste because the post-consumer food waste that Michael's referring to here in Australia is actually the responsibility of individuals. And there's nothing that government or industry or other people can do, it's actually up to each of you and it's about you talking to other people about the issue of food waste and, you know, and what people are doing. And, it, and, and often it's just misinformation, whether it's used by dates or um, best before dates or whether it's that you can use the whole part of the, the animal, um, you know, the nose to tail type concept that there are other parts of the animal besides a steak. Uh, but it's, it's the responsibility of individuals and it's this abrogation of responsibility that's brought on food waste. Someone else has got to sort it out for me. Okay. Question. Several of you have raised the points of getting E back into the RD and E continuum. And I know a lot of work is being done trying to solve this problem. Um, no one really knows how the extension system is working now with state governments pulling out of extension quite extensively across the country and the rise of uh, ICT technology and the opportunities into the future. So with a few uh, farmers at the table here, what I'd like to know is how do you get your information? How do you get the research, development and extension happening on your farms, is the system working for you? Or how would you want to actually improve the system so you can get better information to make better farm decisions? Okay, Duncan, do you want to start on that? Uh, yes, well, traditionally, when I, when I first went to Hay, it was uh, through the Department of Agriculture. I used them for, uh, for uh, extensive help on um, selection of genetics for my merino breeding flock and advice on, um, from the agronomist on uh, rice layouts and things like that, and that's no longer there. Private industry, private, uh, like Elders and Landmark, have slightly taken up the slack there, but um, uh, it's really, fortunately, through improved communications, going from a party line telephone 30 years ago where you crank the handle and hopefully get an operator to now obviously having satellite connection and internet. Um, that's, that's my major source of information, plus I'm probably in the fortunate position of being able to, in going around to meetings and whatever, getting um, cross-feed of information from, from other uh, farmers in other areas. But uh, a lot of farmers probably aren't as fortunate to be able to, to do that. But uh, and if you're not computer savvy, then it, it must be very difficult at times. Um, uh, apart okay. from what you read in the papers or hear on the news, that'll be about it. Jennifer wants to jump in. Um, yes. Um, uh, when I did my Nuffield, the, one of the things that the incidental in pieces of information or observation I gathered was this is a worldwide problem. Um, nearly every agricultural uh, country I went to at whatever developing stages they were in um, had an issue on extension and it's like who wants to take the responsibility and I suppose um, in terms of Duncan's it's traditionally been um, in, in, in rural areas a public issue and then um, government say well we're not going to fund that anymore so now the private sector well the market will pick it up well you know that doesn't work um, um, effectively enough and, um, and, and I think Duncan's hit on a good point. Technology, I think, is going to be one of the tools we use for extension, but somebody has to actually um, deliver it out there. And to me, there's a disconnect sometimes between the people that are doing the research. I think there's really fantastic research being done, but how they connect with farmers. And one of the great things is farmers learn best from farmers. So if you can get those researchers out into, on farms, doing trial work. You know, most farmers that I know, want to, they're, they're innovative people, they're smart people. They want to look at what new things are being done and they'll have an opinion about it. They might lean on the fence for a while and look at what's going on across there, but they'll start to have an, in, uh, an opinion on it and they'll involve themselves. So to me, I still think the public uh, sector has a really important role in delivering um, uh, and, and connecting and facilitating extension. Um, and I think th that the private sector can come in um, and, and all sorts of things like that. But, you know, we've got to connect the researchers 
with the farms doing the on-farm work in whatever areas and you know and then we get this you know enormous growth in um, in productivity improvements I believe okay what, anyone else what, wants to talk about this yep. we've seen oh. I've seen a, a, a bit of a trend over the last few years traditionally what we've done is we've hired consultants to scan for new innovative ideas out there and research from the various universities mainly in the states in our business what we've seen is uh, the highly concentrated operators in that agribusiness sector running their own R&D and retaining that IP mm. uh, a lot of the research that's done out of the traditional places you know from Texas A&M to Colorado State to Kansas State that we found uh, when you go over in there and look at some of those projects being run they have some pretty sloppy sample sizes um, they have a lot of variability. Uh, a lot of the data is coming out, we find not as good as it used to be. When we, when we bring a technology that, that sounds like it could work, we run trials in our own yard and the tax rebate uh, is very helpful in, okay. so in I'm doing sure I'll that. Be pleased to hear that. But then the extension is done within industry. It's up to the individual bodies when somebody within that industry publishes their results for the industry to okay. share. Another question up here, number six. Um, I, Brendan Barrett from the Department of Climate Change. Um, I have to say it's been, um, it's been quite nice to hear uh, the faith that people have got in uh, market signals resulting in, in changes in behaviour. Um, I'm sure the Minister's happy to hear that as well uh, when it comes to the, with, to, with the carbon price. Um, but I'm interested in uh, whether Michael thinks that the glut in food might result in a, um, in a lack of uh, signal to the agriculture industry to have to start changing to, um, to climate change as being obviously, uh, I guess, um, biased. I think climate change is the most uh, important issue. Um, and also, more broadly, do people think that the agriculture industry is well positioned to be flexible in the future and to adapt to climate change? Okay, we've touched a little bit on it, but Mark, go okay, ahead. Um, double, double barrel. Um, the, the thing about food is that it's actually probably one of the highest um, carbon producing sectors of the Australian economy. Agriculture is 16.7%, but food in its entirety, because it is from paddock to plate, which involves processing, transport, refrigeration, cooking, and eventually waste, is probably closer to 40%. But it's a rubbery figure. We're not really sure because we silo things. So we have agriculture here, and we have transport there, and we have processing and packaging here, and we really don't know. Um, but it's, it's incredibly important. Um, there is no, well, there is no price signal really for carbon at this point in time. I mean, it's coming, um, but so I'm not sure how my farm in particular would actually take that on board because there isn't a price signal there. But um, my, my concern is if we've got this wrong, and, and we may well do, the, figure, the numbers tell us we are and the symptoms are telling us we are, we've got it wrong, is that calls to uh, increase agricultural production by 70% uh, compound the problem. And if it's the, one of the largest emitters, um, which it is, and that includes global trade, and I support free trade, provided it's fair, we have a, um, we've got a major problem on our hands. And this is why I'm saying we need to actually have a look at our underlying assumptions about what's actually needed. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a wicked problem, really wicked. OK, Philip? I just wanted to address the the uh, question about whether or not uh, farmers are sufficiently adaptable oh, to yes make a are. change. Um, <laughs> it strikes me if you look back at the productivity growth rate in the agricultural economy compared to the rest of the Australian economy, Australian farming over the last 30 or 40 years has outperformed um, the rest of the economy pretty significantly. Uh, if you think about the structural change that's gone on within the industry over the last umpteen years in terms of um, unilateral disarmament in relation to tariffs and subsidies and things like that, this is an industry that can adapt. 
easily. OK, although there are, are there, is it the case, though, that with a crop like maize, for example, which cannot be grown in temperatures above 30 degrees, there's going to be some changes uh, to what is produced and what is grown when temperatures get too warm? Would anyone like to address that? Well, I think as, as producers, we keep, we keep managing that. That's the variability that I talked about in my opening statement. I spend, we spend all our time thinking about what the impact might be on our business and our production system. So yeah, we're growing things that we were told 20 years ago we couldn't grow. We grow a fodder crop called um, Lakina, which also fixes nitrogen into the ground, which creates a better energy cycle and, and we have um, more nutrition available to our cattle year round. 20 years ago, that was, people were saying we couldn't grow that and the climate at the time didn't allow it. So we're constantly doing that evolution. We're constantly adapting and we're taking the research. You know, for us, we get a lot of that, that research and then we think about what's the implication. I mean, we started looking at things like the SOI and the ENSO and the weather things in 1989 and saying, well, if that's the thing, what's happened in our district when it's looked like that? Not just the forecast, that's information. It's, this is where I say the strategic thinking skills are the important bit. You take information and you apply them to your business. And this is what producers do fantastically. And we need to keep investing in those strategic thinking skills where you can take information and make it relevant and productive for Australian agriculture, because that's what we can do really well. OK, time for one more question. Thank you. Uh, the importance of science-based solutions seems to be a very consistent theme throughout the, the whole conference. There's a range of available technologies uh, which are uh, safe for animals and humans, effective, environmentally sustainable and certainly light on the, um, the value of the new infrastructure that's required to implement them. Um, and for example, GMO crops and uh, growth promoters in livestock production. Um, but they're very politically controversial, of course. I'm wondering uh, what the panel's views are on whether the consumer Consumer acceptance challenges of these technologies uh, makes them just too hard. Consumer acceptance. Yes, well, the, um, well we, we seem to be moving further down a path, the path of the, um, uh, of the precautionary principle. Um, we're asked to accept the science as final on a lot of things in the world nowadays, but when it comes to these technologies, uh, the decisions are based on fear and emotion and outrage and uh, it's very unhelpful. Uh, we're, uh, we export two thirds of our agricultural produce, we're competing on a world market who have these technologies available to them and uh, we are becoming a higher cost producer from it. And, uh, and the examples of, uh, of some of the growth promoters are a great example of that. Um, it's been kicked around for 20 years, been uh, WTO has made rulings on it over and over, but the recalcitrance cal on it still remains. Um, so we, uh, yeah, I'll just reiterate the, how we're ex uh, expected to accept uh, science on uh, some issues and not others. Okay, just, yeah, yeah Jennifer. Um, I, I'd just like to make a comment that we are particularly sensitive about what we eat. And um, we can adopt technologies of IT and, you know, be looking at, at, at mobile phones which are continually glued at our ear and we uh, look at other things. But what we put into our bodies and what we actually serve and what we produce, we are particularly sensitive to. And I think it's an issue um, and I think we shouldn't underestimate, and I, reiter I touched on this earlier, but the role that women play as consumers and providers of food, not only as, as farmers, which is something that's dear to my heart, but it's also just the role we play. The, the growth of organic uh, produce on major supermarket shelves is, is an absolute indicator to me of the role and the importance that women play and what they demand from um, food producers. Um, I sat in lots of old farmers' meetings with farmers that would scoff and cough and splutter at, you know, organics is not this and whatever. And do you know what, the, the generation of their, their daughters are actually feeding um, only their grandchildren organic produce. So, you know, there are signals that the market sends to us that sometimes we don't always want to hear. And I do think there is a sensitivity um, to what, what we eat and, um, and I think that will always be there. Okay, we'll wrap up in just a moment. 
But um, what I'll give everyone one more chance perhaps to say something that they perhaps feel hasn't been brought up and they'd like to or that they'd like to comment on something that has been discussed. We'll start with Philip. Uh, thanks, Rod. Um, I reckon this is a really significant issue is the question of um, what do consumers want and the view that uh, we do have a science-based uh, approach to agriculture. So when the science doesn't seem to agree, when the science agrees with us but doesn't agree with consumer sentiment, what do we do? And I think if you look at the experience of the live animal export industry over the last two years, it doesn't matter that we've got the best animal welfare standards uh, in the world, that we're the, we're, we're the far and away the best, uh, we have the best standards in terms of the export and transport, export and transport of live animals. The Australian public didn't believe it um, and they continue not to believe it. And so unless we're prepared to get out and sell the benefits of the industry and be frank about the, some of the, the problems with the industry that we have to face, some of the social licence to operate issues, I worry about that. I'm not so worried about the adaptability of farmers, the, the, um, the R&D base, uh, the extension, the skills. I, I believe that, that that can be dealt with. It's the social licence operate issues that I think are going to be much more important over the next 20 years than they have been over the last 20. OK, thank you very much. Georgie Somerset. I'll look in that. I'll just follow on from Philip because I think that there's the, the social licence, the opportunity to impact that lies within each of the people in this room. That if you are here because you believe that agriculture is an industry worth having and it's an industry that you want in the future and you want to be able to eat in 30 years' time the food that you're eating now, you actually need to be having the conversations one on one when you hear the misinformation and the misunderstanding about the solid practices that we do have and the science-based practices. You need to take that and actually listen to what the people are saying, um, the consumers are saying, and actually speak to them in their language. And so interpret the science so that they understand that just as they might vaccinate their children, I vaccinate my calves because I don't want my calves getting sick when they're a teenager in my thing. You know, that's a language they understand. It's about the, but it is the responsibility of everybody at every part of the supply chain in agriculture, whether you're a scientist, a researcher, agribusiness, or industry leader or producer, to have those conversations one-on-one -on -one when you hear them, when you have the opportunity. Okay, Don Madden. Uh, I just, uh, I have a concern for the future of democracy. Uh, our political system, we elect leaders to make decisions. Uh, now we seem to have internet-based campaigns uh, that erode that whole political process. Uh, we can head down the track of a digital mob rule, uh, or we can have true leaders who can make real decisions. I'm sure you'll have a lovely chat with uh, Sid uh, at the drinks afterwards. Um, <laughs> Dr Ramesh Chand, any thoughts, uh, final thoughts on uh, anything we've discussed or something you'd like to bring up? Uh, I would uh, like to say something again related to science. I find that in many countries, particularly this uh, plant breeding science, it has come to a full stop as if nothing is possible if they don't do research on GM kind of things. Mm. I feel a lot of other things through biotechnology are still possible other than this GM kind of things. We have example of hybrid maize. So it is not genetically modified, but still we are getting breakthrough in, in maize productivity. So society has not yet, is not yet prepared in general to accept GM, though there may be, uh, these may be only apprehension, the doubt may not be well-founded because society generally is not science savvy. Society in general, particularly in my country, we believe scary story rather than development stories. And uh, many NGOs, they have, I think, influenced public opinion in that direction. So biotechnology involves both genetically modified kind of things and other things which are not GM kind of things. I feel that, uh, that the crop scientists are, um, are uh, biologists and others okay. Uh, till the society accept genetically modified things, there are many other possibilities on which they should focus. Okay, Jennifer Hawkins. Um, look, I just wanted to touch on um, the fact that when you produce your own food, you, you know where it comes from and you're proud of it. 
Um, and I believe that agriculture, both nationally and globally, needs to actually concentrate on agricultural ethics. And we've lost that. We've lost that connection and that trust some, somewhere along the line. In, um, and it's not just corporate agriculture, it's also family farms as well. So we really need to reconnect okay. and have that integrity and that ethics space coming through and that, that sharing of knowledge um, you know, to underpin and take our uh, um, industry forward. Duncan Fraser. I think the, um, the expectation that's uh, become apparent that we are uh, expected to increase food and fibre production by 40, 50, 60 per cent out to 2050 is just unrealistic. And uh, we, we, we've got to think, knowing that we've got uh, probably a fewer resources, is how we um, can better produce uh, food and fibre uh, to meet the needs of the consumer, but also tackle it from the other end and uh, make, um, if we can contribute internationally, it's through the uh, exporting technology and knowledge. And, uh, and we've done that in the past and done it very well. And, uh, and also, I um, totally agree with Michael, we've got to tackle the, uh, the wastage and, and change consumer expectations about expecting perfect food at a cheap price that um, we can, if we can get an improvement in um, reducing wastage by 15%, then we can do it at a far less cost than mm. probably trying to increase production out the other end. Okay, and uh, finally, Michael Croft. Um, just a, a quick word on technology. One of the things that's happening in India, which is fantastic, is uh, SRI, which is Sustainable Rice Intensification. And that's technology. That's actually called agroecology, which is a fantastic new development. So that, that's just one thing. Um, but I'd like to end on, on a couple of quotes. One is from, I'm going to modify it slightly, one is from Wendell Berry who said, eating is an agricultural act. Eating is actually an agricultural and ecological act. Um, and there is actually a, a priority there, which is um, you actually have to have a viable um, environment and or an ecology before you can actually have a viable agriculture, before you actually end up with an economic result. But there is actually a priority. It's actually ecology then it's agriculture, and then it's actually profit. So it, it is actually a hierarchy. And lastly, just for, for the economists in the room, a quote from Mark Twain. When you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. <laughs> OK. And finally, to close this session and also indeed the conference, please welcome back Sid Sidebottom. Well, thanks very much. Thanks to you, Rod, for doing a masterful job in keeping us all together. To our seven panellists, thank you very much for your contributions indeed. And um, you've sent me away uh, thinking a great deal uh, about what you've raised, and that's, the, that, that's very, very important. Can I just share with you some of the um, potpourri of ideas that struck me as we were talking? Uh, first and foremost is this. Uh, we, we mentioned the reprioritisation of agriculture in the full uh, meaning of the term agriculture and everything that's involved with it. Uh, it's perhaps rather than the reprioritising, it's the prioritising uh, of agriculture itself. The connection between uh, um, the rural and the urban, um, a connection that a lot of us at my age, and uh, a lot of you are a lot younger than me, but at my age and more, you did have some connection uh, with the bush, as we used to say. You used to go and visit whole day it took and you knew what animals did and uh, what they didn't do and what was growing and that connection seems to have been lost and we need to reconnect and a lot of that is going to require articulation of what we mean uh, by this fantastic industry and of course it has so much to offer in terms of careers and opportunities which we've raised as well. We need to touch our schools, we need to touch our communities and also in government, there's a hell of a lot of urban seats and not a lot of rural and regional seats. And uh, I think uh, if I got the numbers for rural and regional members across all parties, we could cause a lot of damage uh, politically and be very positive about it too. So uh, we really have a job to do there and I think uh, it's very much part and parcel. Um, I was thinking while we're talking there, and many of you have raised this, if we are what we eat, 
uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what we look like uh, in 30 years. Um, if we are what we eat, uh, then what we do eat is very, very important. And how we go about producing what we eat is very important as well. So, um, and I mean it in a philosophical sense too. Um, the question of GM was raised. And, uh, and also the, ro the, uh, the role of science as an institution, if you like, uh, along with our political decision-making roles. Um, you mentioned uh, the live animal export market and the social media campaigns raised there. Well, I can talk to you about fishing and trawlers as well. And I think when we do raise those issues, uh, you um, raise the... Uh, um, the, the question of, are you fear for democracy? Social media is part and parcel of democracy, and one thing we do at our peril is ignore using it ourselves. If we've got a story to tell, we use it, right? And we use it just as those who might do some harm to us or want to be ignorant about things use it as well. And I just think about GM for a moment. In Tasmania, it's regarded that as being non-GM is a market competitive advantage. Therefore, no GM. Where it isn't, then I suspect the market will decide we can use it. But if we believe the science is right and we believe it is right, then we need to, need to argue that uh, very much so. Uh, Michael, you mentioned if I can remember this, uh, eating was an ecological uh, before it was agricultural. I suggest to you it's generally social as well. And, uh, and therefore, uh, even with, uh, we say about um, uh, what's happening with food, now it's the thing on television. The kitchen reigns supreme. Uh, it's an art form. Uh, you know, it's a, a, a visually an art form and people get excited and actually squeal uh, when they see these celebrity chefs. Um, I'll never get an interview because it'll be a very short interview on it. But it is social and I suspect that's what will happen very much more in the developed world. You know, food is about people being together and the thing that we lose most is that collective thing about being social. And that's what happened with banks. Now they're running back to have tellers at the front desk and everything else. I suggest food will bring us back together as it's driven us apart with fast foods in a very busy world. So I, I reckon it's got a very interesting future uh, ahead. I do thank you all very much for your contribution. You're obviously passionate about agriculture, as people in this room are, and certainly uh, as someone like myself who's converted to it over time. And uh, I can't think of anything more exciting to be involved in. So thank you very much for your contribution, and thanks for ABARES and the department and others for, for putting on such a fantastic conference. Good on you. Thank you very much, Sid Sidebottom, the Honourable Sid Sidebottom. Uh, ruling yourself out of MasterChef, but... I think Annabelle Crabb might have a place for you on Kitchen Cabinet on ABC television. Thank you very much for sticking around for the end of the last session of ABARES 2013. Would you please thank Philip Glide, Duncan Fraser, Ray